Psalm 34, the Lord, a provider and deliverer, a Psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for to those who fear him there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Father, I thank you for the reading of your word this morning. I thank you for this psalm that David wrote and that is in our Bibles Father, I thank you of all the truths that we are going to learn and be reminded of and walk through today. And I pray, Father, that you would use this psalm as only you can in our lives, not only in terms of what we hear today, but how you want to apply it in our lives and make it so real to us as we continue on this pilgrim pathway, knowing that this world is not our home, but while we are here, you have called us to shine brightly. You have called us to trust you. You have called us to magnify you and to invite others to do that with us. And I pray that we would be the kind of women who would do just that. I pray for myself that I even more would magnify you with all that is in me. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, we learn at the top of this particular psalm in our Bibles that Psalm 34 was written by David at a time in his life when he was in terrible, terrible circumstances. He was very much afraid. He was in danger, actually, because it says this at the beginning, the Lord, a provider and deliverer. And then it says, a psalm of David when he feigned madness before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. And so what this tells us, if you do a little bit of digging, which I have been doing, it was written after he escaped from the Philistines in Gath. He was running from King Saul, and he went to Gath, and he went there because he was scared. But when he was there, he was recognized, and people reported him to Abimelech. And by the way, Abimelech is a title. The king's name was Achish, and he was the king of Gath. And then from Psalm 56, we learn that David was captured by the Philistines. And this too was just an awful, awful time in his life. And then it's in 1 Samuel 21 where the story is found. So as David thought about all of his dangerous situations and as he came up with this plan, but pretending to be crazy and insane, that's what he did so he could get away. And you will read this, by the way, 1 Samuel 21. And on your handout, it says 1 Samuel 2, but it's actually 1 Samuel 21 uh, when you get to your Titus fellowships later. 
But it's important for us to understand what was going on in his life. Because of his madness, he was driven away. And then apparently David realized that he was more afraid of Abimelech. He was more afraid of an earthly king than he should have been because he should have put his trust in the Lord who is the deliverer. And both Psalm 56 and Psalm 34 were born, were written from these experiences. And and I'm gonna read Psalm 56, we can't stay there, but I wanna read it to you so you can hear David's heart in this Psalm as well. Be gracious to me, O God, for man has trampled upon me. Fighting all day long, he oppresses me. My foes have trampled upon me all day long, for they are many who fight proudly against me. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you, in God whose words I, whose word I praise. In God I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? All day long they distort my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They attack, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited to take my life. Because of wickedness, cast them forth. In anger, put down the peoples, O God. You have taken account of my wanderings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Your vows are binding upon me, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death, indeed my feet from stumbling, so that I may walk before God in the light of the living. That's the background. That's the backdrop for Psalm 34. And so I want us now to turn our attention to Psalm 34, and it's one of the psalms that I help children memorize. (laughs) And, you know, it's funny because all these years that I've been teaching children to memorize Scripture, you know, there's been just different things you remember, different children you remember over the years. And I still remember the first time one of the students actually recited Psalm 34 because it was the longest one I'd ever assigned. You know, Psalm 1 is six verses and Psalm 8 is nine verses, but really eight because first and last are the same. Psalm 100 is five verses and this was a long one and I threw it in there because I had one young man who, was, who memorized everything. He was just a memorizing machine. And so I thought Psalm 34 is one of my favorites, so I'm gonna put it in there. And, um, and because he, because really he needed the challenge. And I'm telling you what, that child, he is a grown man now, but that child at the time came back and he said, Psalm 34, word perfect, all 22 verses. And I've never forgotten it. I've never forgotten it. (laughs) But it's such a great psalm, and there's so many ways that we can divide this chapter to help us understand it. I mean, there's a hundred different ways to divide it, really. But very simply, when you look at all that David is saying in this psalm, it seems to have a natural turn. And, in the, and I've kind of divided it that way. You have three points on your uh, handout. In the first 10 verses, David, David seems, is focused, not seems to be, but he is focused on praising God, but not just praising God himself, but inviting others to praise God with him. And in naming God's attributes, his goodness, and his response to all of it, that he, he wants others to join him in this because he's so full of God's praises, he wants to share it. And so I really took from verse three, the point one for your outline, which is magnify the Lord with me. And the, it, and the psalm starts this way, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So we're going to stop right there, and we're going to notice that David says, I will. He doesn't say, I'll try, or I'll do my best, or I'll see what I can do about this. I know I'm supposed to do this, but, but so I'm going to try. I'll do my best, because that's often what we say. But, you know, for those of us who are married— when we got married, we didn't say, when we, were, when we were supposed to say, I will, we didn't say, well, I'll try, or I'll think about it, or I'll do my best. 
No, we said, I will. We said, I do, because we were making a vow, not only before God and to God, but we were making a vow to that person. Not, well, maybe I will, maybe I won't. No, it was an act of your will. It was an act of my will. I'm making a choice. I will. I will promise you these things. And that's the idea here. He is willful in his choice. I will bless the Lord at all times. He's resolved to celebrate God because that's what blessing means. He's celebrating. He's calling attention to God. He's saying wonderful things about God. He stands on God's promises. He's fixed on God. I will bless the Lord at all times. And so when he says at all times, he's speaking of a constancy. Not just when my life or David's life is the way I want it to be. Not just when I'm being praised by everyone. Not just when things are going well for me or experiencing good times in my life, but all times. And you know, it's important for us to remember when things are, if we're in a season of our lives where things are good, you know, it's like, you know, I don't really have a care in the world right now. So, you know, everything's going good. My job's good. My, my kids are good. My, my homeschooling's good. My, you know, husband's good. My marriage is good. You know, those are the times we really need to be investing even more to studying the great doctrines of Scripture and being grounded in them so that when the bad times come, and they will, we have a reservoir on which to draw from. We are like that tree firmly planted by streams of water that yields its fruit no matter what comes around. And we also need to be praising God in, our, in the good times and in the bad times. And, and again, just by way of reminder, he's wrote this when he's after this horrible, harrowing experience of running for his life, of hiding in a cave, of pretending to be crazy, knowing that people wanted to kill him, being captured, that he could be murdered. And of course, I will bless the Lord at all times. What, doesn't that make you think of something in the New Testament where we're commanded to pray without ceasing? It's not that we're always on our knees in our prayer closet. And it's not, I will bless the Lord at all times, that we're constantly just reciting phrases of blessing toward the Lord. No, it's... Speaking of a heart attitude, walking with praise on our hearts, ready to pray, ready to praise, a heart turned toward the Lord, a heart of looking up in terms of what is God doing in my life and I'm going to praise him through it all. And when we bless God, we are speaking good of him. We are talking about his attributes, his kindness. Even when we don't understand, even when things are hard, God is kind. Even when we're going through very difficult times, he's kind. He's good. He's sovereign. He cares. We say all the things that we know are true about him from his word, choosing to bless God. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. There it is again, continually. There's that constancy again. And where is God's praise? What does David say? He says, in my mouth. So this tells us that David spoke out loud about God. He didn't just think it in his mind. But he spoke it out loud. God's praises were in his mouth. He was verbal about it. He's praising God out loud. And even this reminder to me is one of the reasons this year in your Titus fellowships, I have your Titus moms reading the passage out loud as you start your groups. There's just something about hearing the word of God read that just does something for you. Hearing the word read, not just our opinions about the word or what we think about the word, but having his word read. I mean, it's one thing to read God's word silently and hear it in our minds, but it's another thing to read it out loud and hear it. I mean, even hear our own voices. Like sometimes if you're having your time with the Lord in the morning, whether you are listening to it or you're just, instead of just, you're reading your Bible, but read it out loud. Because then you hear your own voice tell of the praises of God. And David's also bragging about God in this psalm. In verse 2, my soul will make its boast in the Lord. So his boast is in God. It's not in himself, not in his good deeds, not in his clever ideas, not in his greatness. 
And then he says, the humble will hear it and rejoice. So think about that. Again, he's speaking out loud, and he's speaking out loud those who are, when, he, when he's doing that, those who are humble hear it and rejoice. They take it to heart, but they're rejoicing in it. You know, proud people don't hear it that way. Proud people only, only want to hear about themselves and their own accomplishments and the good stuff that they do and how they did this about God and what they did for God. But humble people have a heart for the Lord, and they, when they hear people boasting about the goodness of the Lord, they rejoice in that because they are so thankful for the goodness of the Lord. You know, I was just listening yesterday to a man talking about a very hard, very hard time in his life when he lost his son. And my heart just rejoiced hearing him because he was boasting in the Lord. He said everything that when we got the news and we were walking through this deep, horrible valley, he said, I knew God was kind. I knew God was good. And then he quoted some passages from Scripture. And as I'm listening to him, thinking about that, knowing in some way what that is like, it's like, you're rejoicing because of who God is. You're thinking about the goodness of God and having another believer remind you of the goodness of God from God's word makes your heart glad. I mean, and let's think for a second about sometimes when we've, we'll, we'll make a little turn here, when we hear people's testimonies of how they came to know the Lord. And have you ever thought about how Sometimes in those testimonies, it's like they're boasting about their past sins. Or it sounds that way. Almost like proud of the fact that they used to be a scoundrel. And that they tasted of all of the terrible stuff in the world. And that they had relationships with all these people. Or they did all these horrible things. And yeah, they talk about how they got saved, but so often or sometimes the emphasis seems to be more on what they did before they got saved than how God changed them. But here's the thing. Humble people are so thankful that God saved them out of their wretched sin, and we're all wretched sinners. They don't want to talk about that stuff anymore. They don't want to think about it. They don't want to revisit it. The only times that they would revisit it or talk about it is if in some way God wanted to use it to help someone in particular who's struggling with that. Or, or they might talk about it in a general sense because they know other people are struggling with horrible, wretched sin and they haven't come to faith yet. But they need to know that there's no sin that's so great that God can't save them from it. Because here's the thing, humble people want to bless God. They realize that they're wretched sinners. And now David turns and he not only talks about how the humble hear it and rejoice, but then he issues this invitation to other people when he says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So this is David wanting others to praise God with him. Join me. Let's talk about God together. Let's talk about his greatness. Let's talk about him. Let's talk about what he's done in your life, what he's done in your life. He invites the people to exalt God, and to exalt God means to lift him up. He's already high and exalted. He's already lifted up, but we are to lift him up. And we're to do this at all times. Again, just by way of reminder, David was in fear for his life. He had acted like someone who is, had lost his mind. He was hiding in a cave. But still he knew he was to praise God in the midst of his fear. So David was hiding, if you want to think about it this way, his physical body hiding in a cave. But yet God was his refuge. And why was he inviting others to praise with him? Because he knew of God's faithfulness. He knew it. He says this when he is such an, in such a low place in his life, when everything seemed to be against him. That's what he says in verse 4. When he says, at first he says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. 
I mean, I sought the Lord. He looked for God. He's looking for God in his circumstances. And then he says, I sought the Lord. He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Didn't necessarily take the circumstance away right away, but he delivered David from his fear in that circumstance. And then verse 5 says, they looked to him and were radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. Don't you just love that word, radiant? (laughs) There's so many ways to think about this particular word, but it mainly refers to our countenance. You know, this countenance of looking up. No matter what our concerns, we look up. And when we look up and we look to the Lord, our faces are radiant. You know, in Exodus 34, the scripture says this. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. I mean, they knew something was different. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. Verse 33, when Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. So when Moses was with the Lord, his face was radiant. And they all noticed it. They noticed that he had been with the Lord. Psalm 89 verse 14 tells us this, How blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. O Lord, they walk in the light of your countenance. I mean, y'all, there's so much in God's word about our countenance. Our countenance reflects our hearts. And yes, we can have a sad countenance. Of course we can. We can have a sad countenance, but yet still be joyful. I mean, remember like when Nehemiah was before, I mean, and it was noticeable that his heart was sad and he was sad about what was going on. And then Hannah, when she's praying, you know, Eli the priest notices that she's sad. But then when she's been with the Lord, she's heard with the Lord, then she goes away and her countenance changes. But y'all, there's a difference in the sadness of those who trust in the Lord and those who don't. I mean, think about too how there's, No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no guilt anymore. There's no shame. There's no malice. Because God has saved us from that. And it's the evil one as a saved person. When he has saved you and there's no... There's now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's the evil one who wants to keep dangling your past sins in front of your face to keep you there, to keep you in shame, to keep you filled with guilt over things that you have been redeemed out of. That's the evil one who wants to shame you. The Bible says if you've come to know the Lord, there's no condemnation I mean, think about how if you're guilty about something, it shows up in your countenance. I mean, think about how we as moms, we know right away when the countenance of our children's faces change. What have you been up to? What's going on? And they're like, what are you talking about? I see it all. It's written all over your face. (laughs) There's a reason for that. (laughs) But you know, when... There's great grief in your life, yet you are looking up, looking to God. There's still a radiance, even in your sad sadness. Because even in people's grief, even in their sadness, even in their really difficult circumstances, if they are looking up and they are looking to the Lord, if they are looking to Him, they are radiant. And they will never be ashamed. We're radiant. Why? Because of who God is, not because of who we are. 
And then think about how when we're walking with the Lord, no matter what our circumstances, God gives us a peace that surpasses all understanding. We might not understand it and what's going on in our lives, but then there becomes the point we don't even understand why we have peace in this because we should be falling apart. But that's what God does. That's who he is. That's why we bless the Lord at all times. Being with the Lord, being with him, obeying him, and understanding his goodness in our lives, his praise continually be in our mouths, it just kind of takes away, a, takes that scowl off of our faces. And we're radiant again, not because of who we are again, but because of who he is. And think about this too. He <laughs> says they will never be ashamed. God will never shame you. He doesn't embarrass those who seek him. He doesn't mock us. He doesn't make fun of us or deride us. He doesn't say things, oh, you're coming to me again? No, we are his children if we know him. And then David says in verse 6, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. There's the, hum uh, the humility again. David calling himself this poor man. He knew there was no hope within himself. He knew that God saved him out of his troubles. And he also was experiencing the fact that it wasn't immediate. And it's important for us to understand that. Y'all understand, I know you understand that God allows difficulty in our lives. He brings difficulty into our lives. But yet he promises to preserve us and to keep us through our difficulties. And he grows us through our difficulties. And he teaches us things in our difficulties. And then he says something quite remarkable in verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. The angel of the Lord. That's the, a reference to the pre-incarnate Christ. And it's like he's setting up camp around his beloved. Those who fear him. And he rescues them. I mean, it's such an amazing verse <laughs> because Christ was with David. And think about it. It reminds me of Elijah when God opened the eyes of his servant to see the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. The angels were there to protect Elisha and his servant. And through Elisha's prayer, his servant gained the ability to see not just the enemy that made him afraid, but then he saw the angelic army encamping around Elisha and protecting them from their enemies. And if we only knew, it's like, oh my, if we only knew the times when God has done this in our lives, when he has set his angels around us, and we don't even know it, but he kept us from running off the road. He rescued us from things we don't even realize he rescued us from. We just think we're so strong. We just think we're doing all this stuff. But it's God who encamps around us. And it's important for us to realize that this psalm does not promise that we will not have difficulty, we will not have troubles, yet God does promise deliverance. And then David issues another invitation in verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste. That's the word he uses. And it's another interesting word. And if we think about the word taste, I mean, don't you love things that taste good? And you know, when something tastes really good, like a dessert or something, oh, you need to try this. It is to die for. I mean, that's the phrases we use. Oh, this is the best thing. This will knock your socks off. Where, which, it's like, where did that phrase even come from? I mean, but think about something that you really love to eat. Now, for me, it's ice cream. And it's not just a particular ice cream. I mean, it's not just any old ice cream. I don't like junky ice cream. It's like certain ice cream. And I love it so much, this certain flavor, <laughs> that if I buy a half gallon, see, I have to make my choice before I go that I'm not stopping. Because if, I stop, if it comes home, I will eat the entire half gallon in three days by myself. 
And then Carl's like, I always say, don't be the ice cream police. If I bring it home, I bring it home to eat it. I don't bring it home to look at it and admire it in the freezer, and I'm not really happy until it's gone and it's in the trash can. So I have to make the decision not to bring it home. But you know, when you have something that's really good, you want to share it with someone. Taste brings that kind of pleasure to us. And so when we think about the Lord, we're supposed to taste him and see that he is good. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good and never get enough of him and make the decision, you know what, I'm stopping by his word today and I'm going to get a whole half gallon of his word and I'm not going to stop until I finish it. Feasting on him and his word and you know, remember that, <laughs> remember the book, you probably all read it to your children, Dr. Seuss book, Sam I Am you know, green, green eggs and ham, and there's Sam I am in the book, and he keeps trying to convince this person to have a taste, but the man is unwilling. He's not going to eat it on a train. He's not going to eat it in the dark. He's not going to eat it in a box. He's not going to eat it with a fox. He's not going to eat it in any kind of situation. But Sam I am is so persistent, he finally gets him to try it, and then he says he'll eat it anywhere because he tasted it. And he liked it. And that's, for us, it's like, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's such a great word. I mean, think about it. Jesus is the bread of life. That's what he says about himself. And bread is something that we understand. We have to eat to stay alive. And it has to be a constant source in our lives. And that's the way it's supposed to be with the Lord. You can also think about things that taste horrible. You spit them out as soon as you try them. I remember when I was a, a little girl, I don't remember, I, I remember where we were living, and I remember my mother made something with eggplant in it. And I tasted it because my mother was a wonderful cook, but I tasted it. As soon as I tasted it, I gagged and I spit it out. And I didn't even want to develop a taste for that. Even today, I was like, nope, 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 I don't want eggplant. And we ought to pray that our senses would be trained to determine good and evil so that we would spit out the things that are not going to be good for us. Now, I know that eggplant's good for you. But think about this in terms of our lives, that we would taste and see that the Lord is good and all that he offers, his word is good. Everything he says is good. But negatively... When we get a taste of the things that are awful in this world, we should be spitting them out. It should make us gag. We should be disgusted by them. You know, and sometimes I just want to watch a movie. I want to watch a TV show. I mean, just sometimes I want to do that. And I'll read reviews to find out, is this going to be edifying? Is this going to be something that will, you know, might not be about God, but it will be honoring to the Lord. And then I'll put it on, and then immediately I turn it off because I just gag on it. And I don't want to develop a taste for that. I, you know, if I'm gagging on something that's not good, I don't want to keep trying it so that I get a taste for ungodly things. And then David says, how blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. And of course, he's speaking here of taking refuge in him. Again, not just in the things that he provides for us, but taking refuge in him. The one who's really blessed is the one who find his, finds his strength in the Lord and not just in himself or in herself. And David continues, O fear the Lord, you his saints, for to those who fear him there is no want. The fear of the Lord... What is that? That's being in awe of him, understanding his majesty, how great he is, of understanding his power that the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed is the name of the Lord. He, can, he, can, he, he put, hung the world in existence by his speech. He can take us out of this world just like that with no warning, with no preparation, with, with not informing us ahead of time. We should fear him. And when he says, oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, he's speaking here of those who know him, his people, his children. 
he's talking about those who are saved, who've come to know the Lord Jesus Christ through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And we who belong to him, we have everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. That's what the scripture teaches, 2 Peter 1, verses 1 to 4, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, he's talking about the saints, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. I mean, I would love to just stop there. His promises are precious. His word is precious, and they are magnificent. And then he says, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. He says we have everything we need pertaining to life and godliness, and we have it through God. And then Psalm 34 continues in verse 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Now, why do you suppose David is talking about young lions here? I mean, remember, he was a shepherd, and he's seen a lot of lions as he's taking care of sheep. And he knows that they sometimes lack, and they want to go after those sheep. He knows they suffer hunger, and they want to tear up and eat the sheep. And we also know that David tells, you know, he tells King Saul, I've killed a lion with my bare hands. He knows that lions will lack and suffer hunger. He understands them, and he's learned something about them. And he takes what he's learned about lions, and he thinks about himself and about God's people, and he notices a difference. He realizes that God's people who seek the Lord will not be in want of any good thing. They won't go hungry. I mean, God says in his words, he will never let the righteous go hungry. He realizes that God's people are in this refuge. They're in this safe place. They will not have needs like the world does because they understand what is truly good. And even when they think they have needs and they think they have wants, when they look at it through the eyes of the Lord and when they have tasted the Lord, they know that he is good and he is providing everything they need pertaining to life and godliness. And even when we think we know what is good for us, and we wish we had it, and we wish God would answer that prayer, and you could do it if you wanted to. We say that to the Lord, but still, if we know the Lord innately, we know that God knows better than us. He knows what's good for us, and that's why we look up. That's why we look to him even when we think he's withheld something precious, or that's why we look up when we think he's taken something that he shouldn't have taken. We look up because he's kind. He's good. And now we come to point two on your outline because this is where we see a little bit of a shift in David's writing from an invitation to praise, oh, magnify the Lord with me, to, pers- to instruction to teaching, even preaching, if you want to use that word. Let me teach you. That's what he says. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. And he uses the word children, and I think of 3 John uh, 1, verse 4, when John says, I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. And when Paul calls Timothy his true child in the faith in 1 Timothy 1, 2, and here David is calling believers to listen to him as he teaches on the fear of the Lord. And then very practically he says this, Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? I mean, isn't that what we all want? David knows that. Most people, if not all people, want want to live a full, happy life. They want a long life, and they want to be in good health during that life, and they want to see good in their lifetimes. So he's appealing to this particular longing. 
And this verse, by the way, is quoted in 1 Peter chapter 3, right after Peter. I mean, if you know 1 Peter, right after Peter has given marriage advice. In 1 Peter chapter 3, the first part of that chapter is dealing with, he's talking to wives and marriage. And I shouldn't say advice, it's commands. It's God's word. It's not advice, well, maybe I'll hear it, maybe I won't. No, this is what God says. And he's, giving, he's telling wives what they are to be like and what they are to do. And then he turns from giving the wives this instruction to a, and giving husbands their instructions and telling them what they should be like and what they should do. And then he says this in verse 8, to sum up, to sum up, you know, I've talked to the wives, I've talked to the husbands. All of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult. And, you know, that's, I always think about that because it, it, as soon as I read that, it's like, because that's what we do. We love to, if your husband insults you, you're going to insult him right back, and you're going to go one up, and then he'll go one up. <laughs> or insult for insult, and then he says, no, no. That's not, don't do that. He says, and this is what he, that he says, to do, but give a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. And then he says this, for, and now he's quoting Psalm 34, the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Remember, this is right after he talked to both the husbands and the wives. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so he's telling the husband and wives, this is is what you need to be doing. And it's from Psalm 34. Basically, if you want a long, full life, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit, deceit. I mean, isn't it hard to do that? Proverbs 10, 19, when there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. That means it's hard not to sin when you talk all the time. I mean, that's what the, that's what the Bible says. And then it says, but he who restrains his lips is wise. I mean, you can always say more, but you can't take back what you said. Proverbs 17, 27, he who restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. And then Matthew 6, verse 7. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose they will be heard for their many words. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 14. Yet the fool multiplies words. Talks all the time. That's what a fool does. No man knows what will happen, and who can tell him what will come after him? And of course, the book of James tells us that if we can control our tongues, we can control our bodies. But here in Psalm 34, we're learning that if we fear the Lord, we will keep our tongues from evil and our lips from speaking deceit. The positive part of that would be that we speak truth. And that's the ninth commandment, too. We are not to bear false witness against our neighbor. We are not to speak in deceit about other people, telling half-truths about them or leaving out parts so people will believe certain things. In fact, it's listed twice in the list of things that God hates in Proverbs 6. There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him. That's for added emphasis. He really hates it. And then he says, haughty eyes. A lying tongue and haughty eyes, that's proud people. Oh, no better. A lying tongue, there it is, a lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, there's lying a second time, and one who spreads strife among brothers. So we have to ask ourselves do you speak deceit? Do you lie about other people? Do you talk all the time and multiply words? Do you control your tongue? Do you restrain what you say? Proverbs 21, verse 23 says, He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. I mean, just think about that. The wisdom just in those few words. 
Just think about how much trouble we get into because we opened our mouths. Then God follows with, depart from evil and do good. I mean, basically, this is like run from sin, just like Paul tells Timothy, flee immorality, get away from it, replace it. But, you know, and the thing is, when God gives us negative commands throughout his word, we already see it right here in Psalm 34, he doesn't just like say, empty yourself of this. No, you empty yourself of this, but you fill it with this. You replace it. That's why he says, depart from evil and do good. You know, I mean, that's just what God does in his word. And then he says, seek peace and pursue it. Seek, there it is again. You're looking for, you're looking for peace. You know, the Bible says, you know, blessed are the peacemakers. You pursue peace. You never like lower God's commands. We're not talking about compromising on what the truth of God's word is. We're just talking about peace in our relationships. If you're at odds with someone, you be the first to make it right. Be the first to say you're sorry. Matthew 5 says, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, not necessarily that you've sinned against him, but he's, got, he's holding a grudge or what, you know, he's got some, she's got something against you, leave your offering there and go at the altar and go be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering and you might want to substitute husband in there you might want to substitute some family member in there be reconciled romans 12 verse 18 says if possible so far as it depends on you be at peace with all men we can't make everyone be at peace with us we can't make someone stop hating us or we can't make someone stop holding grudges against us but as far as it depends on us we can be a peacemaker in that situation and then the third point on your outline is the contrast between the wicked and the righteous so as we continue we see this contrast just got, rises up much like the contrast we saw in Psalm 1, verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. Okay, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. This is an expression of God's love for us, his care for his people. Remember in Psalm 1 where we learn, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, and I always do this with the children of the Lord, knows the way of the righteous because I'm helping them see that he knows his own people. He sees them. He knows them. He knows us. He loves us. He's intimately acquainted with all of our ways. And it's like in Psalm 34, 32, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. We're dear to the Lord. I mean, even when I read Psalm 56, it's when, when the phrase was in there about God putting our tears in his bottle, he sees them. He knew what David was experiencing. He knew he was running from his life. He was teaching for his life. He was teaching David to take refuge in the Lord, not in his circumstances. God keeps his eye on you. I mean, you ever say that to your kids? I'm keeping my eye on you. I'm watching you. You know, God's better than us. I mean, I just love that, that he sees me. He watches out for me. He encamps around me. He knows what I need and when I need it. He knows when to intervene. He knows when to hold back. He knows when to lean in. He draws near and he is near. Even when we don't see him or think we feel him, when we can't find our way, he's right there. He sees us in the dark. He knows the way we trod. I mean, y'all, I love that hymn. I've loved it since I was a little child. Have faith in God. I taught it to all my kids. It says, have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God when your prayers are unanswered. Your earnest plea he will never forget. Wait on the Lord. Trust his word and be patient. Have faith in God. He'll answer yet. Have faith in God in your pain and in your sorrow. His heart is touched with your grief and despair. 
Cast all your cares and your burdens upon him and leave them there. Oh, leave them there. Have faith in God, though all else fail about you. Have faith in God. He provides for his own. He cannot fail, though all kingdoms shall perish. He rules. He reigns upon his throne. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. Have, he, he cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Y'all, that's who God is. In his ears, the scripture continues, are open to their cry. I mean, there it is again. We have a special, when we come to know the Lord, we are very special to him. And he hears us. His ears are open to us. And he doesn't have, I mean, he's not walking around with his fingers in his ears. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. No. Not when it comes to his children. But look at the contrast of the wicked and how God is toward them. I mean, think about, think about this. His ears are open to their cry. And then verse 16. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. God is against them. He will destroy them so they will not be remembered. That's what he's saying here, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. We may think we are being overtaken by evil in this world, and it sure seems to be that way, and like we're on a fast track. Because we see it everywhere, and it doesn't seem to be letting up. It's like, is there no end to the evil that people can come up with and that they can, that they can try to foist upon our children? But we're not going to be overtaken by evil, especially when we remember that the face of the Lord is against the evil and against evildoers. It's important for us to know this. Because we're always telling people that God loves them. But we need to tell them in the right context. God does love them. He wants to save them from every lawless deed. He wants to deliver them out of that. He wants to save them out of their sin, out of their wickedness. He's not giving a stamp of approval and saying, well, it's okay. And I love you so much it doesn't matter. No, he wants to save them out of it. And here's the thing. This is what his word says. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. Yet, God remembers the righteous, those who belong to him. The next verse, the righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. So if one of these evildoers cries out to the Lord in humility and says, Lord, save me, God will deliver him out of that. And David knows this not only from the word, but from his own experience. This has been his life all throughout his life. And he delivers his people. God delivers his people from out of their troubles. Not from their troubles, but out of their troubles. I mean, y'all, sometimes God allows just deep, deep hurt and deep, deep suffering for what seems like an eternity. But y'all, it's not an eternity. Sometimes it seems to have no end, but it does. Sometimes it just seems to last forever, but it doesn't. And sometimes we think that we should be exempt from suffering. I mean, I know I, I certainly want to be exempt from suffering. <laughs> And we think we should be exempt from suffering, especially if we're walking with the Lord and in obedience to him. But God wants us to know we are not immune to trials and hardships, but yet God promises to deliver. He will not let us be destroyed. In Matthew 12, 20, Jesus quoted Isaiah's prophecy about himself in verse, in verse 3. He says this, a bruised reed he will, this is Isaiah's prophecy, a bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. And in that context, Jesus was sharing with his disciples how he was faithfully bringing forth justice. He had just healed many bruised reeds. 
And Jesus understands what it means to be bruised because Isaiah 54 tells us that he was pierced through for our iniquities. Another translation says bruised for our sin, bruised in our place. Isaiah also tells us in chapter 61, says this, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to captives, captives, and freedom to prisoners. And here's the thing, y'all, we're all bruised reeds, every single one of us. And even today, some of you might be particularly bruised today, maybe in grief, maybe you feel like you're in a prison of loneliness. I mean, I was talking to, a, met with a, one of our missionaries a few months ago, a missionary, it was just a missionary wife, they're both missionaries, but she, one of the things that she shared with me is just how lonely she is. I mean, maybe some of us today are dealing with slander against us. People are saying things about us that just simply aren't true. Maybe some of us are paralyzed by fear. But what we're learning here is that God promises to deliver us out of our troubles, not from them, but out of them. Nowhere are we promised that God will exempt us from troubles in this life. Nowhere. And then he says this in verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, lowly, contrite, and saves those who are crushed in spirit, devastated by something in their lives. Just shattered God is telling us that he's near to us when we are broken hearted and crushed even if we don't feel like he is he is there he's encamped around us he draws especially near when we are devastated he's not far away he's so near and then verse 19 continues, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. There it is again. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Righteous people, saved people, are going to have many afflictions in this life. So we must expect them. We shouldn't have unrealistic expectations. And then we must be so grateful when God sends just a reprieve. I mean, don't you love that when sometimes you've just been so crushed and so devastated by something in your life and you just think you will never come out of it? Even though you know God is with you and he is kind and he loves you and he is near, but then in his sovereignty, he lets it, he lets it up and there's a reprieve. And we must be so grateful for both, for the affliction and then the reprieve. And there's some things in our lives that will always be in the background, hurts in our lives that we will never get over, but we will get through, and we will get, and God will deliver us. And then verse, the next verse 20 says, he keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken, and you think about that, God cares about our bones. <laughs> He cares about our bones. I mean, think about when, when, in Genesis, when, you know, they're carrying Joseph's bones. Bone, Joseph was very clear. Carry my bones. Take my bones with, with you. And y'all, he will take tender care of us on this earth until our work is finished. And then he'll take us home. But nothing can touch us until God takes us home. We may be here 21 months or 80-something years but God keeps us safe until he calls us home, and then we're safer than we've ever been because we're home with him. He tenderly cares for us. In John 19, Scripture says this, in the Jews, because it was the day of preparation so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken so they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. Him is Jesus. 
But coming to Jesus, when they saw he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. I mean, Jesus, even on the cross, was tenderly cared for by his father. Not one of his bones was broken. And think of it, Jesus died, but he was resurrected. And y'all, you know, we all know of godly, very godly people who've suffered greatly on this earth, even murdered for the cause of Christ. But when the godly die, they are delivered into the arms of Christ. So we Christians will experience difficulty. God heals the brokenhearted. But that's a reminder that the heart was broken. He saves those crushed in spirit, but the spirit was crushed. And in this life, as we as believers may even have more troubles than the wicked in this life. In fact, their lives on this earth may be a walk in the park compared to a lot of saved people. However, the difficulty and the trials and the brokenhearted things we walk through on this earth will be over when we go home to heaven. We will never experience difficulty again when he wipes all our tears away. We will never be hurt again. We will never be slandered again. We won't have to say goodbye again. We will never be crushed in spirit again. But the ungodly, the wicked, they will experience it all for all of eternity. (laughs) And it'll be awful. The Bible says there's weeping and gnashing of teeth and utter darkness there. It will be torment, and it will never, ever, ever end. So think about it, saints. (laughs) Our heartaches are only in this life. And even though we may experience many heartaches and afflictions in this life, we don't experience them alone. That's why we look up. We have the Lord on our side. He's encamped around us. And not only that, we have the body of Christ to come alongside and help us. What will we do without the body of Christ? I mean, God's given us brothers and sisters in Christ who come alongside and give us those tangible hugs and that tangible meal and that tangible cleaning or whatever it is. They don't know what else to do, but they do something. But even more than the body of Christ, we have the Lord Jesus Christ who cares for us who tells us that we can cast all our cares upon him because he does. The Bible tells us he carries us in his arms. He heals our broken hearts. He saves us. He delivers us. He walks with us. And because he was bruised for our sins and because he was bruised when he lived on this earth as a man, he understands when we are battered and bruised in this life. And then... We have the promise of the resurrection. You know, I mean, we have the promise of the resurrection. Every time I visit a grave of someone I love, I'm reminded of the hope that we have in Christ. We don't walk alone. And knowing that their bodies, and if I die before Jesus comes, my body as well, those bodies that are in the grave, they'll be raised up out of the grave. And those who are alive will meet them in the air as we meet Jesus. That's such a glorious hope. That's why we look to him and we're radiant. (laughs) The wicked do not have this hope, and it's so sad for them. Verse 21 says, Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. There's a lot of haters of the righteous today. We're seeing them, at least in my lifetime, in ways I've never seen it. And there is a great divide, just like we learned in Psalm 1. Evil will overcome the wicked. Evil will slay them. That's what the verse says. They will be condemned because they did not accept the great bearer of their sins. That's Jesus Christ. They will bear their own sins for all of eternity. 
But listen to the difference for believers. Verse 22, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. I mean, there it is, salvation. The Lord redeems. He rescued David out of his troubles during his lifetime, but more than that, he redeemed David for all of eternity. And that's what God does. He redeems, he rescues, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. If you've placed your faith and trust in his death, burial, and resurrection, you're not condemned. There's no condemnation for you. Have you taken refuge in him? I mean, we all want deliverance from trouble in this life. But what's so much more important is being delivered from our sins and taking refuge in our Savior. Father, I thank you for the truth of Psalm 34. I thank you how much you've used it in my own life. Father, I thank you for the reminder that you redeem the soul of your servants. And we know from your word that you have done that because of your son, Jesus Christ, way back when we first learned in Genesis about the creation of the world and how perfect it was. And then sin entered in chapter 3. We learn it in Genesis chapter 3. And even then when Adam and Eve sinned, we sinned with them. But you promised a Savior. You promised redemption. And Father, I'm so grateful that you have redeemed my life out of the pit. Father, help us to be women who will magnify your name. Who will tell of your wondrous works and the greatness of who you are. Father, help us to be women who look to you so we will be radiant as we share with a lost and dying world that they too can be delivered from their sins and brought into a right relationship with you. And then they too can magnify the Lord with us. In Jesus' name, amen.